Aha, success. Okay, so we are recording. Um, so let me hand over the floor to group 238C. Thank you, Dr. Trom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Michelle, and I'm joined by my group 238C, otherwise known as the Bench Warmers. Um, and we're here to present the Solar Reflective Harmonic Drive, or SORED. I would like to introduce my team members to you. Uh, we have Shabul, Justin, Jacob, myself, Garrett, Gergen, and Jack. In this presentation, we will walk you through the design overview, product development stages, key specifications of our product, and how our module performed in different milestone tests, cost and future testing and development uh, pertaining to our prototype. And if you have any questions at any point in the presentation, we kindly urge you to wait till the end so we can get to you and answer accordingly. So uh, our motivation for sticking to the baseline design provided was our passion to understand harmonic drives and their complexity, uh, choosing a system that was no longer onto orthogonal axis of motion caused several design challenges. However, our team's biggest strength was new concept ideation, and this complemented our economic engine, which was to optimize material use and to reduce cost. So therefore, our hedgehog concept ended up being, uh, being best at designing our harmonic drives with minimal material possible. So let's talk about the design highlights. Um, so in our design, we used harmonic drives, which uh, the current one being used uh, gives 60 to 1 uh, gear reduction. And then in conjunction to that, we used two 45 degree elbows, which pro provides us the full range of motion required for the project. And uh, most of our material is 3D printed and most of our parts, apart from the ODS parts used and the bearings. Um, and due to our design ingenuity, uh, it allows us to do quick assembly with minimal fasteners used. I'll hand it over to Jacob. So as mentioned, uh, we decided to use a harmonic drive in our heliostat. A harmonic drive consists of a wave generator, flex spline and a circular spline. In our heliostat, we refer to them as the flex and drive gear. And for the operation of a harmonic drive, the wave generator rotates within the flex spline, creating a wave-like effect, which then causes the drive gear to rotate. And one of the downfalls of the original harmonic design shown is the large amount of wasted space in the flex spline that allows the metal spline to flex. And since our flex gear is PLA, our design cut out a lot of material by utilizing only the teeth portion of the flex spline and reducing the size of the wave generator. And our design also utilizes two bearings instead of the large amount shown in the original design. Go to the next slide. Uh, harmonic drive has a gear reduction of 60 with the flex gear having 120 teeth and the drive gear having 122. This gear reduction allows a high torque that can overcome wind speeds of 90 miles per hour. And the higher gear reduction also allows high precision with a small error value of 0 0.03 degrees per step. This is important when utilizing many modules in the entire field with some being very far from the central tower. The image depicts the flanges connected to the bottom of the flex gear that have a slot for the screw to be inserted into the stepper motor. And the image also shows the bearings with interference with the flex gear because the, the motor hasn't been turned on yet. And there's also a pin extruding from the drive gear that hits the limit switch and lets it know when to reverse rotation. And lastly, there's also a notch in the drive gear that allows for torque transmission between the drive gear and the elbow. So these are some of the connections that allow easy assembly of our heliostat. The elbow has built-in clips onto the casing that restrict the movement to only rotation. There's also a built-in lip on the elbow that ensures the drive gear won't slip vertically. And the reflector module has a removable clip that allows easy insertion of the reflector. And the um, there's also the image of the nut insertion where the screw can be inserted to attach the 
module to the elbow. And the base also has four raised clips that press on to the four corners of the motor, fixing it in all directions. Yes, hello. I'm the main design engineer and we'll run you through our um, prototype development. So consistent with our uh, design, uh, our desire to explore the limits of harmonic drives, we initially tried to go with the highest gear ratio possible of 70 to 1, which resulted in teeth slippage and inaccurate 3D printing. Multiple other uh, ratios were then tested until a 60 to 1 ratio was found to be the best highest ratio uh, with great 3D print quality and no teeth slippage. On the right hand side, you'll see um, past iteration of our gearbox and how the flex gear was printed as one piece with the base. This resulted in very smooth movement, but uh, irreplaceable gears that will not allow flexibility in design and testing. Uh, the drive gear uh, was secured to the elbow screws, as you can see in the bottom left um, image, uh, the drive gear was secured to the elbow through screw through screws and uh, nuts, which later we changed to a simpler, cheaper design utilizing notches to restrict rotational movement and a lip to restrict lateral movement. You can go to next. Yeah, so the wave generators were actually the hardest to design as the tolerances were crucial for harmonic drive success. Uh, when the wave generator is too big and pushes against the flex gear uh, too hard, the motor would either stall or the wave generator would break. Uh, if it is too small, on the other hand, we suffer slippage. Eventually, we resided on the perfect uh, diameter, the perfect size, and on a set screw to mount the, the wave generator to the shaft and a clever clip system to secure the bearings uh, to the wave generator. Next. The elbow also passed through multiple iterations to perfect the snap fit dimensions and rigidity. Uh, as well as to add the notches and the lip uh, previously introduced holding the drive gear. Next. Here are all the OD OTS and 3D printed uh, parts used in our design. All right, so I was in control of wiring the entire module and writing the code for controlling the heliostat. Uh, it was a great learning experience because we don't have a lot of electrical classes in mechanical engineering. And so it was definitely a learning on the fly experience, mostly with all of our electronics, like including the two stepper motors and the uh, the ESP32 microprocessor. It was you look up how to wire it and you plug in the wires into the breadboard and hope it worked. And we, we figured out to get a really nice working electronic system. I made a diagram on the right showing our wiring for one of the motors. We, of course, had two of them. But as you can see, there's a lot of wiring. And if I showed you a picture of our breadboard, it would have made everyone cry, probably. But uh, this is what it does. Every electronic basically has power and ground and then either one or two wires to the microprocessor for, for data transmission. We also, here you can see the limit switch. Uh, at the bottom, it's, it's fitted snugly into, the, uh, into the, the design to keep it away from the environments and uh, to keep it consistent. And so now I'll go to, oh, this is a, uh, a conceptual housing that we made for the electronics. Since we were testing indoors, we didn't think it was worth the, uh, the time or the, the money to print this and to put our electronics in it, but we have this ready in case we ever wanted to implement it outdoors. So on the programming side of it, it was all done in the Arduino IDE. And I also kept this very simple, not only so that everyone in the team could understand it, but for future uh, classes that they can continue where we left off. Um, I used only pre-programmed Arduino libraries and ASCII codes, which uh, easily took the command we were giving to the serial port and converted it to the code so that the, uh, the ESP could understand it. Um, we, what we would do is we would give it a, a letter, uh, for example, M to move the, uh, the motor. And you can see the readout on the UI here. You'd be able to control which motor you wanted to use, how fast you wanted it to move, where, where you wanted it to move. And uh, we were updating variables the whole time to, so we knew exactly where we were. And uh, this was very helpful when we were doing the inverse kinematics, which Justin can now talk about. Perfect, thanks, Jack. Uh, so to understand the dynamics of our heliostat, we modeled it actually as a robot arm in MATLAB. We derived the model with Denovit Hardenberg parameters and then used those to create a rigid body tree object that we could simulate all possible orientations for the heliostat mirror 
based on our rotation angles, theta one and theta two for our two elbow joints. The rigid body tree object and its uh, functions were specifically used to get the coordinate transformations from the base of the robot to the end effector, which in our case is the mirror. So the figure on the right here shows the rigid body tree object in the home configuration, which corresponds to theta one and theta two equal to zero. In this configuration, you can imagine actually that the mirror is completely vertical and facing due east. Next slide, please. So in determining the required joint angles to reflect beam radiation from say some point A to a target at some point B, there are three vectors that are important. The vector from the center of the mirror to the beam source, the normal vector at the center of the mirror, and the vector at the center of the mirror to the target. The correct orientation of the heliostat mirror will meet two conditions then. All three of these vectors need to be coplanar and the mirror normal must bisect the angle between the beam and the target. So next slide, please. So for known coordinates of the source of the beam and the target, the correct orientation for the heliostat was determined iteratively by checking all the possible angle combinations. So here you can see the out output of our MATLAB program, our angles theta one and theta two to reflect the beam coming from directly above the heliostat to the target at those coordinates. The figure on the right shows the orientation of the rigid body tree model after the joints are rotated by theta one and theta two from the home configuration. And this was very useful for verifying the results of the input commands for our heliostat during testing. And now Gergen will actually tell you more about some of the tests that we conducted. Thank you, Justin. So as useful as engineering calculations are, they only serve as a baseline for the iterative design process. And in order to ensure complete functionality of the heliostat, we put the design through several tests. One of those tests required the ability of the heliostat to withstand winds up to 90 miles per hour. And as you can see on this slide, the heliostat has a defense mode where the solar collector is oriented parallel to the ground to minimize the surface area and thus the drag force um, to prevent toppling and other kinds of damage. And the test was simulated in a wind tunnel and was successfully passed by our heliostat. Next slide, please. Another functionality parameter that had to be tested was the reflection accuracy. The goal was to demonstrate that our design will reflect light from a ubiquitous source such as sunlight to a distant target with angular accuracy of plus minus 0.5 degrees. Uh, the test setup is presented on this slide. The heliostat was attached to a quick release coupling with a laser source pointed down on the solar collector. Next slide, please. Um, the design demonstrated the ability to hit the targets with both closed loop and open loop control. Unfortunately, though, the heliostat did not reach maximum accuracy as it hit certain targets. The possible reason behind the inaccuracy is due to vibrations caused by tolerances of the 3D printer, issues with the mechanical assembly, motor drifting, and other possible causes presented on this slide. So breaking down the cost of SORHAD on the left side table, the cost for the unique parts of the prototype are shown for a single unit build and per unit in a production run of 3,000. Production run costs were estimated using savings quoted from McMaster Car when buying in bulk, and these will be further reduced by manufacturing redesign for full scale production. And on the right side table, the cost for the lab supplied parts that were non unique to our design are shown. Next slide. So, the value from our system design derives from the considerations for our replaceable parts, a low part count, and simple manufacturing and assembly. Next slide. So, why choose SORHAD? Our choice of a harmonic drive provides an innovative design that allows for precise and quick movements. Additionally, our unique configuration of two 45 degree elbows challenges the students to develop new approaches to solving the inverse kinematics of the system, while also providing a compact design with a focus on designing for accuracy, low part count, and maintenance. And with this, I'll hand it back to Shabul to talk about the future of SORHAT. Yes, so um, we mo made some modifications, right? So for the future, hopefully. Flex the flex gear is modified to be comprised of two parts as shown in the bottom left um, picture. Uh, the purpose of which is to absolutely ensure that the flex gear does not rotate, which is what we suspect was one of the possible reasons for target inaccuracy. Furthermore, the base has a lip surrounding the drive gear 
to ensure it does not translate in the drive gears uh, plane, which actually is, is the most probable mechanical reason for target inaccuracy. Um, a thin lift was also added to the elbow as uh, noted in the image uh, to make sure that the flex gear does not travel vertically. This is on the image uh, at the bottom to the right. Um, and moreover, a simple cover was added to the wire exit uh, for the protection of wires and the internal components against weather uh, and stuff like that. Next slide. Yeah. So finally, uh, since we claim to be the best at ideation and innovation, we also chose to create a design for self-washing heliostat by modifying the solar collector as seen uh, here. Uh, this design allows the reflective surface to be slid in and then tightened with a screw and bolt. Also the adjustable tightening allows flexibility in dimensions and larger tolerances. Finally, between the two hinges, we will attach a pipe with holes that is controlled automatically through a central control, uh, central a control hub to regulate washing and eliminate the cost of regular washing surfaces. Next. The last thing is the future concepts that we uh, hope or the teams after us, we hope they would include. First is induction uh, to transfer electrical power to the top motor to allow infinite degrees of rotation and to save on wires, obviously. And the second point is uh, exploring the split uh, ring compound planetary, um, the split ring compound planetary gearbox, which is uh, which is shown uh, at the bottom of the slide, and then the last point is um, probably the one that is most challenging is to use one motor to rotate both axes um, using solenoids to switch between different uh, gear gearboxes. So each gearbox will be um, will be used to rotate one axis, and then you'll have a solenoid to move, um, to basically switch control from one gearbox to the other and thereby from one axis to the other. Uh, and that's all, thank you all. And Justin will now manage questions from here on. All right, great. Thank you for the presentation. Um, do we have any questions from our panel? I'll go ahead and start with a question. Okay. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, go back to the cost slide, please. Yep. Okay. So, and I'm sorry for anybody on the panel that's going to hear me sound like a broken record at this point. Um, do you guys, did you take into account any labor costs? So any manufacturing, any assembly, anything along those lines? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. That's definitely a valid inquiry. I, since you mentioned, I do not think that we did consider that. Um, I know one of the things we talked about sort of with the idea of mass production is how much do we consider for a design because it's not fully um, optimized for mass production yet. So what do we know about how it's gonna be produced in the future and how would we go about projecting that cost? That was something we found to be a little bit tricky. So we didn't exactly go that far, um, but definitely something to note for the future. Yeah, I would definitely say that's something you want to keep in mind because in any company, one of your largest costs lots of times is labor, 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 labor. Um, and that's going to maybe not necessarily for your prototype, it wouldn't drive up your cost as much, but yeah, if you're making 3000 units, it's definitely going to add some dollars to your price. So really take a look into that. Absolutely. And I know, and I'll also just make the comment that there was something we kept in the back of our heads and for our value proposition, we wanted to make sure mm -hmm. our assembly was easy so that we could keep labor time and assembly time down and obviously keep mm -hmm. that cost then. So perfect. Yeah. Thanks. And I guess to add one last point to that is, uh, since we're managing the mechanical design part of the team, um, through every uh, iteration, through every design that we made, um, one of the biggest, biggest components was always making it very, very easy to access everything. Um, working also as partly a mechanic, I also understand the frustration if an engineer doesn't design something that is easy to, um, that is easy to fix or, easy, or facilitates easy labor. 
So at, uh, we, we're one of the only teams that, for example, implemented um, uh, snap fits and stuff like that. So that should all be, um, uh, be considered later on towards the cost of, of um, the assembly labor and so on and so forth. But there was, no, a, there was not a formal calculation for the reasons posted uh, by Justin. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, <clears throat> we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, so we got to jump to the next presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, we're getting a, a little bit of virtual applause uh, <laughs> in the <laughs> in the chat. So, okay. Um, so you. seeing. Oh, seeing that is there's no more questions from the panel. Um, I think we can wrap it up there um so i just want to thank you guys for for sharing your design with us this afternoon and and i guess my kind of parting comment is is th this is the first time that i've seen a group that um presented like forward-looking plans right like what the next iteration is going to be um so i appreciated that that you guys are already um you know kind of thinking ahead to how this thing is going to evolve in the future which it definitely will right we're going to do the exact same um process with the with the summer classes we did with you guys and hand them all of your designs and ask them to iterate further on those so um i'm appreciative that you guys are thinking ahead and you should definitely put those forward-looking thoughts into your final design report so that groups in the summer can see them and take them into consideration as they're picking which um which helios sets to move forward for small batch manufacturing so um anyway just wanted to say that i, I appreciate that um unique element that you guys added to your presentation. So uh, with that, let me hit the stop, <coughs> stop record button.